Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart, and today I'm joined by Liam Martin. He's, uh, this is going to be a different one, and it's also, fair warning, one of our longest podcasts ever. Now, I'm here recording a special intro, and I normally don't do this, but what happened was Liam's an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. I usually do a little preamble before, the, before we start recording, and we just started talking about sales, about outsourcing, about everything, and man we just got carried away and all of a sudden we've been 20 minutes in and I was like, this is some really good content. I just wanted to keep it rolling for you because I didn't want you to miss anything great. So if you're going to, so stay tuned. We got Liam Martin from time doctor staff.com. Also the founder of running remote. Uh, we're going to talk about how he, some lessons he learned outsourcing his sales development team and a ton of mistakes he made. He was super open about all the things he did wrong. So I think this is going to be a real valuable one. Now buckle in because it is definitely well over an hour, probably closer to an hour and a half. We'll see you there. Um, I was going to ask uh, in about Cairo. So devs, what's the like? What would you what do you budget for like a senior level dev there? It really depends. Uh, we have guys that are as cheap as a thousand dollars a month U.S. that are out of Cairo that are doing a lot of front end stuff, and I would say. Um, on the lower end or sorry, on the higher end, I mean, we have people that are three to 4,000 us per, per month down there. So it really, it really, you can probably have it just low and I think that'll be okay. The audio doesn't necessarily pick up and, or maybe I'll mo even move somewhere else. Are we doing, we're doing video background too, right? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to stay right here actually. And if there's, if you hear any other audio popping up, just let me know because she's cool. going to be um, doing audio, but very, very low. Uh, so yeah, so between a thousand and four thousand a month, um, the average salary in in Egypt is, I believe, two hundred US per month. Wow. So even someone that's paid a thousand dollars a month is is fucking stoked like uh, versus someone that is making three thousand dollars a month they're making they're doing five hundred thousand in sf level salary um so they're they're in very good shape and they can stay where they are yeah which is the component that we really sell when we hire remotely for these for these people is do you really want to move to any of these other locations and generally the answer is no they want to continue to work from home um they want to stay with their family you know they have they have parents they have grandparents that kind of thing and they really like being able to stay close to where they are and then more and then also too sharing that knowledge so having that asset in that local market that can then go and educate the rest of that community is something else that we find is the right way to do things uh, as opposed to focusing all of that in Vancouver, San Francisco, Toronto, trying to Boston, extract talent York. out of certain places and relocate. Yeah. I mean, San Francisco is great, right? Like Vancouver is great. The talent there is, is extraordinary when we're in all of these, just, I would call them almost like, I don't even want to call them first world cities they're more important than that. Like there's a whole bunch of first world cities where you don't have this phenomenon. I, we need to come up with a term, but I would even call them like idea, like nexus points where you have the money and the talent and they're all coming together in a really safe environment where you can come up with these epic ideas. Mm -hmm. Those only exist in maybe 20 cities in the world. And Vancouver is one of them. Um, you know, Toronto is one of them. Uh, San Francisco, New York, London. Uh, these are all of these epic nexus points that we're just seeing huge companies come out of them and huge ideas. And I think that for the rest of the world to be able to catch up, you need that talent at least located in those other points to be able to 
start to build that same thing as well. I, I go to Manila quite a lot in um, the Philippines and Manila is 30 million people. And I'm here in Ottawa and which has the population of about a million people, but there are more tech unicorns in Ottawa than there are in Manila. You know, why does that exist? Well, it's because they have the right pieces in place to be able to build those types of companies. And Manila has the talent. There's very smart people in Manila. They just lack the, they lack that special nexus kind of point. I think there's just, yeah, we could get into that a little bit deeper, but um, that's another kind of side benefit of remote work is the talent stays where it grew up. And yeah. then by extension, it can then educate that, that surrounding community, even through osmosis. Hmm. So when you, when you open up a, when you hire somebody remote, do you always hire somebody remote where you, like you typically have a couple other people or when you hire somebody <clears> remote, no, like, so say, that, do you try and hire two? That starts to bias our decision-making, unfortunately. So when you, when you, we have this philosophy in the community called remote first companies. Mm -hmm. So, which is we hire remote first, meaning um, let's not bias ourselves to there are two or three other people in that particular city, or let's just find, here's our budget. We have $5,000 a month for a developer. What is the best human being we can find on planet earth that can apply to that budget? And that just makes everything very simple. And it also massively expands your, your job uh, hunting capabilities because you just have so many candidates that you can run through. Like there's never, we never have a labor shortage, um, which is what a lot of VC backed tech companies in the Valley, I mean, that's their number one problem mm -hmm. is talent. Yeah. Uh, and then also too, that talent doesn't leave you within six months, right? To jump onto the next thing. There's not anywhere near as much competition, at least for right now. So we don't think about the particular city. We just say, what's the best talent? We find that person. And then we, this is why we end up hiring in places that not many other people would necessarily hire in because we really stick to that fundamental uh, rule, which is forget about where they live, just focus on can they do the job and can they do the job better than anyone else. That's interesting. I, I, I figured the biggest, like the, it's a great idea. The, the thing that I think I would struggle with is like, how do you get the word out? Right. How do you, how do you find a developer in Cairo? So we have a, we have about 32 different job posts, job boards that we post on. Well, wow. every time we do a new, um, a new hire and we have to have at minimum a hundred resumes before we build a short list hmm. off of that. And we can do that relatively cheaply. We have overhired a little bit for recruitment in HR. So we have six recruitment HR people out of a headcount of almost 100. Wow. Uh, and the reason why we did that was because we really wanted to make recruitment a critical component of the way that, that we operate as a business. Um, and we have that all internal. So we've actually found... We'd love to be able to see companies that are doing, that are doing really good for remote. There's a couple honorable mentions like Top Talent um, Crossover that do this relatively well. But fundamentally at this point, they're very expensive and we can still, we can hire a full-time HR person for the cost of the recruitment services from these other types of companies. And the other beauty of it is since it's so open right now in terms of talent. It's actually pretty easy because there's a whole bunch of people that are really excited about working with us because we work remotely and they can stay where they are. We had a, a guy that <clears throat> I think he got fifth or sixth place in the Facebook hackathon that they run every year. And he got an offer from Facebook and from Google and he's working with us for about a 10th of the salary because he did not want to leave Bali in Indonesia I and he wanted to stay me. with his family. He just, he, he, he's been there in his entire life. He loves Indonesia. That's where he wants to stay. And he would much rather work for us for a much lower salary where he's happy versus working for three, four, five hundred thousand, but having to move to Bali. That's wild, man. 
I don't know if we're in the podcast right now or not, but <laughs> I was actually thinking, I'm like, I, we're, I, I think this could okay? probably be the podcast right now. Like this yeah, could can be we cut that in? conversation. Yeah. Cool. Cause I feel like that's probably something that not many people know about. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just don't get like, they, they don't really understand what's happening with remote work. I think a lot of people poke at it. And I think because we have some negative aspects to remote work, there are some people that just say, that's not for me. I had a, I had a meeting this morning with a guy that is a specialist in building um, AI teams remotely. Very smart guy. And he said, well, none of, uh, he, he, he talked about very specifically how he's trying to stay away from digital nomads. Because he's saying, you know, they've trashed what it means to be a remote worker. Like remote workers are just quiet people that work from their offices or sorry, work from their homes or work from co-working spaces. And they just, they don't, they don't want to work from a beach all the time. Mm -hmm. That gets tiring. I've done it. It's, it's not like you'll get it out of your system after six to 12 months, but there's such a vocal component of what I would consider the umbrella of remote work that a lot of people, a lot of employers would say, well, I don't want that type of mess of dealing with a person that's going to be traveling to a different location every single month. And it actually is a bit of a logistical challenge <laughs> to be able to follow some around, someone around every single month. I think I had discussed with you GitHub that has, they've actually developed an app now for all of their employees' mobile devices to know where they are 24-7 because they've had instances where um, Puerto Rico is hit with a huge hurricane and there are a dozen people in Puerto Rico that are absolutely critical to the success of GitHub and they needed to like get a private jet to fly them out of Puerto Rico. Whoa. So those are examples of problems as it applies to remote work. Like if you have a server admin and you only have three server admins and two of them are in Puerto Rico and you're running GitHub, you got to get a private jet and get them out of there and or tell them, get the hell out of Puerto Rico before this hurricane hits. We're going to get you a flight to get out. Yeah. So that's an example of just stuff that kind of people are a little bit apprehensive about starting with remote workers because they think it's all about being a digital nomad. But I would say for every digital nomad you see, there are a hundred remote workers sitting behind them hmm. that are very quietly working at their desks uh, or at the, you know, or on their couches in their spare bedrooms. And um, they're more productive than the on-premise employee. They're a lot more happier than the on-premise employee. And if people just focused on that component, I think we would see, this movement grow a lot faster than it currently is right now. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah. we have this interesting culture at our company where the majority of the team is in person. So it creates a real strong center of gravity here in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. And then our, our dev team is, has been always, has always been remote. Now, mm-hmm. now, coincidentally, most of them moved to Vancouver. Um, mm-hmm. We hired a couple of people from Brazil. They were in Sao Paulo or Rio um, and they, you know, have moved to Vancouver and, um, but they all still work from home. They just happen to choose to, to live in Vancouver. And I think that's sort of the, it's the easy, like step one version mm-hmm. because we, we tried it the other way, uh, where we had, we had people in a couple of people across South America. We had a couple, we had a guy in Italy, we had a guy in Russia mm-hmm. and we just found it was sort of, and I think for us, I think it was just the organization and the management experience of running a remote team that we just didn't have. And so for us, it turned out to be a little bit chaotic. Yeah, there's a, we call it in the remote workspace, we call that a phenomenon of, um, and you just pointed towards it, a center of gravity. So there's kind of two decisions with regards to remote work. Do you have a founder executive team located in one particular place? And then the remote workers distribute it around that space. If you try to do that what happens is and it happens just automatically without you even interacting with it is all of your employees start to come into that space Mm -hmm. very slowly and the reason is 
they feel like second class citizens outside of that central nexus. So they get all of the interaction with the decision makers in that central space. And then outside of that, they don't feel they feel like they don't have as much control over decision making. Um, even though they may be very important inside of the company, someone that may even work below them or doesn't know anywhere near the amount of information that they do would have a would be able to make more change inside of the organization simply because they're close to that executive team. So we create uh, it for us. We've always been fully distributed. So what we mean by that is like I'm in Canada. <clears throat> my co-founder is in Australia. So it's as distributed as you possibly can get <laughs> from an executive perspective. Yeah. Uh, and we've, we've seen that as a really good mix. I know uh, Joel from Buffer. Buffer has made a really hardcore commitment to saying these, you must be fully distributed, meaning the executive team will, will not be in a single place at a single time. So all of these people will literally be outside of, uh, if they all end up in the same place for an extended amount of time, they need to kind of break that up. Um, and then if they're, you're not going to do that, then I would go to a departmental level. So what I mean by that is the CTO and the development team should be completely distributed and they should be able to make all of their decision making disconnected from the rest of the organization. And that seems to also work in some instances, but when you put the CEO, the CTO, the CMO all in one place, that's when you have a conflict of interest where the marketing people, the development people, the customer support people all start to kind of suck in. Um, to that particular area. And it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just the people that are left on the outside will feel more lonely and left out from decision making. So what we suggest when we see companies like that is really make sure to listen to those remote workers input and make sure that you're not biasing yourself between your employees that are close to you and your, and your distributed employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. My um, so we have we have a version of that, but my co-founder is actually in Santa Monica. Um, but okay. still, I'd say the the majority of the sort of operations, like I'd say, sort of ninety. We have what do we have 30, 30 people here. We have seven people in Cancun, and then two people in California. Um, and so I'd say first, certainly the center of gravity okay. has has evolved here, even though my co-founder has been down in Santa Monica. And I think he's actually moving. He's, he's threatening to move to Scotland later this year. Uh, so. I mean, yeah, time zone, that might be a bit, bit of an issue, but I think you'll probably still have three to four hours of overlap time. Yeah, we'll still have some overlap. And we both work different hours. Like I've got young twins. He's got a hundred kids. So like. So why Cancun? That's an interesting, I have not heard that very often. So we had, um, we had a, outsource contractor that we've been using for a couple of years in India. Okay. Uh, Cause you know, you read the far for our body and they're like, I can't remember the name of it. It was like Brown bricks or something like that was the name of the outsourcing firm that he used at yep. Brickworks India. Yep. Anyway, so th that's, that's the book that I think a lot of people read and were like, I could be a digital nomad. I could work very little and blah, 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 blah. See, but that's I, the, by the way, that's the critical component, which is negative work very little. Hmm. Well, I didn't, I didn't mean the, to sort of imply digital nomads don't work very little. I meant to imply you, people that read the book feel like you can work. Yes, but what I mean by that is because we've get, we're getting this negative feedback loop from the guys that are saying, hang out on the beach, you know, work seven minutes a day and you can be a millionaire. And I have yet to see a singular individual. And I talk to a lot of people that are able to live that type of a lifestyle. You know, mm -hmm. they discuss passive income. It doesn't exist. <laughs> anyone that is, you know, anyone that thinks that passive income truly exists is either they don't know what they're talking about or they are in a state where they've put in a whole bunch of time and energy into building a business. Now they're not doing anything and they're existing in the interesting in-between space before that company starts to drop off. Mm -hmm. And that would be, it's not passive income. You're living on fumes. You're, you're living on the labor that you, that you invested at the very beginning of the process. So 
I, I get very frustrated when, um, when that comes up because it is one of those things that comes up as a recurring theme, unfortunately, and I'm trying to, trying to get rid of that. I, I work not an, not an exorbitant amount of time, but I'm at least putting in 40 to 50 hours a week at what I'm doing. Uh, I used to be putting in like 60-ish hours a week. <laughs> I've taken a little bit of a break. But yeah. uh, anyone that is expecting to work a couple hours a week and have a business that is able to fully support them, I think is probably going to get replaced by people that just want it more and work harder. 100%. 100%. I think that was the big sort of the lie out of that book. And yeah. I, I think he presented the, yeah, there's a bunch of interesting ideas, but I think overall, I don't have a very strong, uh, very positive view of that book. Um, when you actually, it, it, he, when he addresses that issue a little bit more, the four hour, um, it's the four hour work week that you're referring to, right? Yeah. 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 So he was saying the four hours is the work that you don't want to do. So like registering your tax return or answering emails of people that you don't necessarily want to answer the emails from. But then he's saying the work that you want to do, he doesn't necessarily consider work, which if that premise were true, then I think we're all living the four hour work week that are really interested in, in what they're doing with their lives. Um, but I, it, it is probably a little bit of a bait and switch because that was not communicated from a marketing perspective. Um, and a lot of people have taken it on as, oh yeah, you can do Possible. it. Yeah. Yeah. And you just like, you can't. Um, and I, I will tell you, at least in my experience, which is quite broad, uh, you cannot do it. <clears throat> you will fail. Yep. That, that was sort of, I, I remember reading that book and thinking, oh, there's all these like information products and this and that. You can do this. And it's like, you, you, you get to know the, the people that are actually running those businesses. And it's like, they hustle. Uh, like, I thought getting into being an entrepreneur, you know, you'd work for, years and then you, you get this pound and pound and thought, okay, that's like very good money as an account exec, uh, sales manager, um, to making zero money as an entrepreneur and working two to three times as much. Yes. Uh, now, I would argue there's a great little meme on this, which is <clears throat> you have a, let's say you're making a salary of $100,000 a year. So that's your continuous salary that you're going to have for the next 30 years. Yeah. Entrepreneurship, you go to negative 20,000, making nothing, <laughs> making 10,000, then making negative 20,000 again. And very, and then, but if you make it through that period, then you're up to 500,000, a million, 10 million, 20 million. But you need to be able to put in that work at the beginning to be able to get the results at the end. And if you actually look at it, and there's been a few studies on entrepreneurship, Everyone that starts, like, your numbers are better if you stay in a job. So you will put more money in your pocket if you just stick with the job. Um, the percentage of the population that everyone looks towards is the 5% that succeed. But they're not paying attention to the 95% that fail. So it's a very risky endeavor to be able to go and work on your own. And my suggestion to people that are starting that is, what do you like to do more? Do you like the job that you're in? Uh, is it just an issue of money? Because if it is, you're going to make more money if you work for yourself. However, if you're like me, uh, one of the reasons why I decided to become an entrepreneur is because I work really badly inside of organizations. I end up getting fired or quit within six months from pretty much every job that I've taken um, and it's because I just don't work well in that type of environment. I need to be in control of that type of situation. So for me, and I was able to put in the work uh, to be able to build out those types of businesses. So my perspective would be, if that's you, then absolutely go into entrepreneurship. But if you are just saying, yeah, I, I really just want to make more money, the numbers show pretty definitively that staying in a job is going to make you more money, unless you're that lucky 5% that end up hitting it big time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to complain. I feel like we're doing pretty well. But I look at some of the some of the people that uh, I went to college with that went into sales that went into sort of leveled up and leveled up and leveled up. And now they're mm -hmm. selling for or they've been selling for SAP now for 10 or 15 years. And um, 
they're making they're doing pretty well they're doing pretty pretty good and and not that they don't work hard. I like, I, I know they, they certainly do, but I think there's like working hard for a, a large company and then there's entrepreneurship, which is a different beast. Yeah. I think there is putting in time at 10 PM because you just want the business to succeed. And in, and if you're working and doing sales for SAP, you don't really need to do the call at 10 PM. It's not something that's critical. Um, towards that type of organization. So I agree with you on that one. It's, um, it's a different type of beast. It's a passion project. Do you really care about what you're doing? Which is the other thing that I talk about a lot when people are interested in embracing entrepreneurship is do you actually just really like what you're doing? Because you're going to be stuck with it for the past, for the next five, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like talking to remote companies. I think that they're interesting. Um, I, I very much like the subject. If I was doing it for, honestly, I could do it for free. I really like it. Um, so if you find that, then if you, if you find something that you would do for free, then just figure out how to make money off of it. And then you're, you're happy with whatever amount of money you get. Um, but it can, but also choose something that you're going to make a ton of money with as well. <laughs> that always <laughs> makes it a little bit more fun. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, helping companies with sales, running this podcast is something I would do for app for, for, for free just because I learned so much and I, I have such a good time. Um, we did go on a bit of a tangent because you asked me about Cancun and I started talking about four hour work yeah. week. Then we sort of ranted about Tim Ferriss for a bit and then yep. bringing it back to Cancun. Basically we had an outsourced team in India. Um, it was a good experience, but it wasn't a great experience. We were trying to like meld them and get them to be more part of the team and it wasn't anything to say about the people of India. It was this specific contractor. We just didn't have, it wasn't a bad experience. It was just, and we still work with them. Um, it just wasn't an amazing experience. And so we thought, okay, well, here's some of the things that we'd like. Where can we find that? And uh, I had friends that had offices all around the world um, from you know the, the Philippines to Russia to Ukraine to uh, one was starting up an office in Africa. Um, and then a friend of, friend of mine had an office in uh, Merida um, which is three hours west of Cancun. Okay. He's like, man, the people are great here. You got to come check it out. It's good talent, good this, good that. Great culture, super safe, really nice city. Um, so we went down um, and basically in a couple of days, we had managed to hire a couple of people at similar rates that we were uh, paying our team in India. And we were in like locally, it was uh, a good raise for, you know, above market for what the, the salaries were there. Um, and I think comparatively, we, we were hiring a business in, in India. So we were paying more. We weren't like we were paying a big multiple on the salaries. Yep. Um, but the, the salaries were similar. Uh, the time zone, we're in Vancouver. So Cancun's three hours, sometimes two hours uh, in front of us, depending on daylight savings time. Yep. Um, and, you know, we're building a, a support team there and then a sales team there. And I figured... If I'm going to have this, you know, to convince somebody to say, hey, go to sort of Bangalore and, and train people, right? One, it's a long flight. Two, you know, there's, there's lots to do there, but it's just not as easy of a sell as, hey, go check out, uh, go to the beach in Cancun. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So, yeah. So what we found is in Merida, there were great people. We had a tough time finding senior people that had really strong English. Um, and we checked out a couple of resumes and we booked a couple of meetings in Cancun before we decided to, to head across. And like, so we were there for a week. We had two people in Merida in two days or three days. And then wow. we, while we were there, we lined up 20 interviews. Uh, we did a bunch of interviews remotely and then we lined up four or five in person. And uh, okay. by the end of the week, we actually hired a person in Cancun and um, they'd built teams for Amex and a few other large companies. So we okay. found really experienced people. Um, six hour direct flight from Vancouver, three hour time zone difference. Yeah, I have found that um, I was just in Cancun. That's why I asked because the, their downtown, uh, downtown Cancun is actually pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And another hotspot that I've been really surprised at is uh, Playa del Carmen, which is about an hour south of Cancun. Mm -hmm. And it's been a huge repository for remote workers. So expats that just want to be on the beach and there's a certain type of energy there that's really nice to that type of city. And there's high speed internet. So they've been, there's a, there's a huge community down there, but it's been, it's interesting that you chose Cancun because I always kind of 
think of them as a um, resort city it's as opposed to a working city. Fair. And that's actually why we chose Cancun. Um, not because we wanted to go there and party, uh, but because the, they were, we were looking for people that had experience in sales. And we knew that most of the things that we were going to have, like we, we're not having people, we don't have people down there that are selling into North America, but we mm -hmm. do have people down there that are selling um, or involved in sort of sales activities. And Got so it. we wanted people with sales experience and we figured a resort town would have a great, uh, great pool of people that had sold for timeshares. And, and yes. that's, that's what we found. And so we can get multiple languages in, you know, English, Spanish, Portuguese, um, and, you know, a bunch of different and tons of great sales talent. So hmm. that was the Very reason. Cool. So my friend had the, with the office in Merida, he had their, uh, their Brazilian sales office in Cancun because it was the only place where he could find, uh, Portuguese speaking people. Hmm. Yeah, no, I find that that's so interesting that it's just, Anywhere that you have a million people with high-speed internet, you can, you can hire talent out of that place. And that's such an empowering concept to be able to get, I think, everyone's head around is that talent, like the, there is extraordinary talent in every city on pretty much every subject that has more than a million people in that city and has high-speed internet. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, and you're able to extrapolate on it how many how many cities on planet earth with more than a million people i mean it's a lot uh and how much of that labor is currently underutilized where they're hustling timeshares and maybe they could be doing something a lot more rewarding with their lives that they enjoy uh quite a bit more it's um it's it's quite exciting we we have a uh ironically uh, we do a lot of email marketing and we've hired almost exclusively from Nigeria. Um, so, you know, those like Nigerian email scams that yep. you get where you're, I'm a Nigerian prince, please forward me $10,000 uh, and I will do X, Y, Z for you and I will give you $10 million. Yeah. So that's where a lot of those guys cut their teeth. And they were doing things that were really scammy, really illegal. And we've come to those people or those people have come to us saying, I want to go legit. Like I want to be, I don't want to do this type of work anymore. This is not rewarding to me. Yeah. And it's been amazing the type of talent and the, the talent there is very expensive um, because it's in demand. Like we're talking at between two to six thousand dollars a month uh us for that type of talent but they are tip of the spear they're better than most email growth hackers in san francisco because really? you've been doing it for 20 years and they understand everything that, that you could possibly think of in that space in terms of email marketing and deliverability so if you take that weapon that was really designed for evil and you turn it towards uh, what I would consider good, maybe some people would disagree with me, it's, a, it's, it's something that they find a lot more rewarding. They're a lot happier and you can just find this talent anywhere. And not only that, I think you can also find better talent in these places because their history just, you know, they, they, they learned this skill for the last couple decades and you just can't get that in a lot of other cities. So you find it any, everywhere. <clears throat> from, from some, yeah, somebody with a growth hacker title that read a couple of books and spent a couple of years studying in school. Like the, yeah. the experience just doesn't- The Nigerian work. guys could run circles around them because they've lived that life <laughs> for the last 20 years, right? They were firing up email servers, you know, burning them out and spamming people and trying to sell Viagra. And then they just come to the conclusion that I don't want to do this anymore. I feel that this is a bad direction for my life. I want something better in life. Well, then we're here. We're, we're ready uh, to be able to, to work with you. But um, you, just, you just don't get that training any other place other than there. That's amazing. And you have 100, 100 people on your team right now? Almost 100 people in 28 different countries right now. Wow. 
yeah. 28 different countries. Mm-hmm. And, and one of those teams is, not, is, uh, is your SDR team. Yes. Yes. And that's what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> so, and there, you know, where, where's the SDR team based? So we have uh, some SDRs in Colombia, uh, the US, Canada, the Philippines, India, and Pakistan. And oh, and we have one person, I believe, in Barcelona awesome. at this point, BDRs and SDRs. So like whoever, whoever's setting the meetings. In- Basically, you made this decision, hey, I want net, I read predictable revenue, I want an SDR team, you just hired a bunch of people and everything went smoothly? Well, I came from, yes, and, and no. <laughs> <laughs> I came from a product-based uh, SaaS development. So you self-serve SaaS. Uh, here's a 14-day trial. Do you want to use the software or not use the software? You can email customer support, but past that point, I don't really want to talk to you. And I thought that that was how you build businesses. Um, primarily because I come from a marketing background. I thought that that was the way to do things. And then I remember reading Predictable Revenue and recognizing um, the first thing that actually jumped out at me was how quantifiable it was. So communicating to me as a quant heavy person, uh, that made a lot of sense. And also recognizing that salespeople were could have an application towards the type of sales that we were currently doing the marketing that we were currently doing really opened up opened up my eyes mm-hmm. and so read the book um went to saster my eyes were opened up more and more because saster is more of a sales focused um SaaS conference as opposed to other SaaS conferences more marketing based or more development based mm-hmm. So we said to ourselves, okay, I came back and I said, we need to build a customer success team. We need to build a, we just have a support team at that point. We need a success team. We need an outbound team and we need an inbound team. And so I started with uh, the first iteration of that team, which was me as the AE, uh, two to three BDRs, SDRs working with me and approaching my top thousand uh, customers that I wanted to close just a complete experiment in enterprise sales because up until that point, we have, we have a lifetime value of $500 uh, to $2,000. So it's in between that point where um, it's profitable to be able to actually run a sales team. And I think that for a lot of people that are kind of in between the product, the product based sales development, or marketing and enterprise sales, you have an interesting problem where your product is so easy for people to start with that an enterprise company will say, well, no, we don't want to do a 10,000 seat deployment. We want to do a two seat deployment. And that's really problematic because then you just can't get that commitment because it's so easy to get those commitments. I remember I was sitting down with a company that had 30,000 employees and everyone was on board to do a 1,000 seat POC, which is great for us. And I had gone through about eight or nine meetings and no one had bothered to check the website from their side. I had just been selling it to them in person. And then they said, oh, well, uh, I think we just want to start with five seats. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, okay, you can do that. And I can't stop you from doing that. But um, that's one of those barriers towards that type of sales development. So anyways, I went out as, a, as the only AE, as the founder-based salesperson with a couple BDRs and SDRs and uh, approached our top thousand customers, did face-to-face meetings and um, got a lot of success. We got a lot of traction. It was an ROI positive. And then I thought to myself, well, this is, this is now the success model that we want to deploy. And um, I recognized inside of that, or at least now I recognize that it was founder-based magic from a sales development perspective. I understood the product so well, and I was so so enthusiastic about the product. And I had been there from day zero developing the product that I could sell this product quite well, even though I'm not a very good salesperson. I would probably call myself, I think everyone 
needs to get good at sales, but I would probably say I'm in the bottom quartile of salespeople. Um, I would not hire myself if I was, <laughs> if I was going to hire someone as a salesperson, as an AE, I would, I would overlook myself personally. Um, so I then said to myself, okay, well, let's build out this, this machine. So we, we hired a, <clears throat> a sales manager from San Francisco that was willing to fly to uh, Southeast Asia, which is where most of our business operates out of. And um, I personally took three months to work with him. And we assembled a local sales team in that area. And I was shadowing him. He was shadowing me over a three-month period. Things looked pretty good. But with enterprise sales, activity is the primary indicator, not closed deals, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. there was lots of great activity that was happening. But we had had... We had not had enough closes to be able to suggest this was going to be ROI positive. But I left, I left Asia, handed him the keys to a team of, I believe, half a dozen or more people. And I went back uh, to Canada to be able to continue to do marketing, which is what I do. Three months later, he emails me back and we had been doing weekly meetings up until that point saying, hey, this isn't the place for me, this isn't the situation, and I need, to, uh, <clears throat> I need to quit. And his primary reasoning behind that was the team didn't have as much activity as it had when I was there. So this is another kind of interesting phenomenon is just the, the, the boss seems to get people activated a little bit more than the manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was super frustrating to me. And for me, in, in my headspace, I had just spent the last three to six months completely focused on getting this salesperson, this sales team up and running, and then being able to give them that component of the business to run with it. And then I needed to get back to the other components of the business that were actually in trouble because I pulled my attention away from sales. So I was in a really bad situation where I had more than half a dozen sales people, AEs, BDRs, just sitting there collecting dust, not really with any leadership. And I had a decision to make. I should either just melt that entire team down and start from scratch all over again, or I take that team on and I start to manage them remotely. And so I decided to choose the latter because I had invested, we had invested so much time in developing that sales team. <laughs> and then that ended, that started what I would probably call my, uh, my year of sales stupidity, <laughs> where I ended up working with sales. I ended up managing a team that I was not adequate, that I did not have the adequate experience to manage properly. And I think that for me, you, you need to constantly exercise um, lessons in ego, recognizing that you can't do everything and maybe you shouldn't do a lot of things inside of the business. So I had, I was managing this team. They were telling me that there was a lot of activity going on, but the activity was mostly just a smoke screen for them to be able to keep their jobs at mm -hmm. the end of the day. They weren't, they weren't coming to me saying, I really shouldn't be working here anymore or you should, you should let me go because I don't think I'm very good. And the other phenomenon, which I only realized later is none of them were leaving the company, which also shows that they weren't very good salespeople because really good salespeople, if they can't hit their commissions, they leave. Mm -hmm. So because they're, they're wasting their time and money. Um, they're wasting their else where they're not, you know, overachieving and hitting their multipliers. Exactly. So they were, they were all very happy to keep their bases, which is another thing that I realize is if a salesperson is happy with their base, um, they're probably not the person that I want to be able to work with long term. Mm -hmm. So we had this situation that ran for about six months and I realized we were getting nowhere. I came back to another come to Jesus moment and the top salesperson inside of that team in Southeast Asia said, well, why don't I take the team on? And I was again at a point where I said, we've invested 
millions of dollars at this point into that team, um, do I abandon that entire team or do I let this guy give it a shot? Who, is a, who has sales experience, who understands sales, he had had 10 years experience in sales. And I said, okay, let's, let's go for it. Let's, let's give it a shot. I'm out of ideas, so let's give you three months to be able to turn this around. And we very clearly identified the KPIs that needed to be met to be able to hit those numbers. And um, we came to, he, he again provided that type of smoke stream that I just didn't, I, was, I did not have the proper training to be able to understand um, properly. Maybe I should have read predictable revenue a couple more times before really understanding that this is what was happening, but it was constant activity without any credit card ads or, you know, purchase orders in the mm -hmm. bank. And um, it also, when I'm looking back at the situation now, realizing, and this is somewhat of a politically incorrect statement, but I think for people that are trying to develop remote sales teams, it's important we were hiring people from Southeast Asia that did not necessarily have, they were, they all defined themselves as salespeople, but they didn't have the sales mindset, which is, do you want to buy this? Are you interested in buying this? If you're not, I need to move on as quickly as humanly possible and move on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the culture inside of Southeast Asia, there's a great article in, um, uh, I can't remember the name right now. Basically, it's a, it was a large study done on airlines finding that there was a much higher accident rate in Southeast Asian airlines than all other airlines. And they couldn't really figure out why. And they recognized when they brought in a bunch of sociologists to be able to study what was happening, <clears throat> it was the co-pilot would see something wrong and would not tell the pilot that they were doing something incorrectly. So this was why we were having all of these accidents in Southeast Asian airlines is because there is an air of superiority to organizational structures. And I would be able to sit down and say, okay, guys, we're not going to talk to large corporate teams anymore. We're going to talk to dog groomers. I think they would really love Time Doctor and we should switch all of our strategy over to dog groomers. I mean, that's an extreme example, but a lot of them would probably go along with that because they would just say, obviously, Liam knows what he's talking about. But a Western perspective, Liam knows what he's talking about. Liam's an idiot. And I need to be able to solve this problem as quickly as possible because if I don't, then my commissions are going to suffer and I'm not going to be able to keep my job. So we had that phenomenon that occurred. And the way that we initially, I came to that conclusion is, uh, Mick, who is currently the sales manager right now inside of the company, was originally coming in as the uh, person in, in charge of the affiliate program inside of the company, but he had had about 20 years of sales experience and was kind of chatting with me about the sales team and not really knowing what was going on. And he sat in on a couple meetings and he kind of sat down with me and he said, these guys are bullshitting you. They're, they're screwing with you and you don't know what you're doing. Um, and that was very direct, but truthful feedback. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, this kind of boils back to the ego of trying to run everything and recognizing that you know what you're doing. I appreciate you going into all the things you've done wrong. Cause I think, I feel like that's where the majority of the learning is, as when we do things that, uh, that don't work out exactly how we planned. Um, and so, yeah, I'm trying to communicate as many failures as humanly possible here. <laughs> uh, so Mick sits down with me and says, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you're not managing this team properly. You're yeah. spending tens of thousands of dollars a month on these bases and no one has hit their numbers. They're not even close to hitting their numbers. It's not like they're close. It's just, it's completely, and there is no upward trajectory that he can see no quantitative upward trajectory it's all qualitative there's no there's no uh trackable improvement so then i said okay so how do we solve this problem and he said well <laughs> i think that 
affiliate marketing seems to be doing pretty well, um, but I think I can provide a lot more value inside of <clears throat> sales development. So we had a we had an initial process where again, and I was apprehensive about letting go. We had him shadow every single meeting that we were doing. <clears throat> he was asking questions. He was asking very direct questions like, so what were your sales numbers like this week? Or I would ask, what, what have you done this week? Well, I spoke to these 28 people and I got these 17 demos and these demos look pretty good and this guy is a 3,000 seater and this guy's a 4,000 seater. And then Mick would kind of jump in and say, so how many people have bought the product? And then just shut up and let everyone talk. And he would do that every week. And it would just very clearly over the four to six weeks that he was doing this proved to me that there was no activity happening whatsoever. And I kind of knew that in the back of my mind, but because I also wasn't very passionate about sales, it was one of those things that I was doing because I knew that it could be a successful avenue towards sale towards the business and could open up another funnel, but I wasn't as interested in it as other things inside of the business. So Mick basically then took over the team and I started shadowing Mick on those meetings. And then within about two months, um, we recognized that we had to melt that team down again. So Mick then let go of the majority of those people. I believe we only retained one person out of the team of, it was more than half a dozen people. And we rebuilt again. And now we have the current iteration under Mick that actually is successful. Um, and that has become a very expensive um, iteration. So we actually kind of failed also again with Mick before we figured out this new iteration about uh, of building a remote sales team. <clears throat> so the first six months that we repositioned everyone, we thought, okay, well, let's continue to hire remotely but let's manage these people remotely. And we weren't finding the success that we needed. And I think the reason why is with sales particularly, there is a, there's a brotherhood or sisterhood of people that are all sitting together and saying to themselves, this is how to close a client or man, I really closed this, this, this was a successful close and everyone's really excited about it and they'll sit in on meetings and it's all of that energy ends up um, really exciting everybody inside of the sales team. So what we had as a, we didn't have that as an experience. And this is, I think why the team was failing at that point. So Nick about six months after that said, I don't think this is working. I think we just need to shut down sales or we need to change something, which also is an indicator of a good salesperson. Mm -hmm. Someone saying, you should fire me. Like this is, this is not working. <clears throat> so we came to the conclusion that what we would do is take these salespeople, SDRs and BDRs, we would fly them in to where Mick was. So we opened up an office for Mick and he would train them directly and we would work with them for about one month remotely. So we would do all of our hiring, our recruitment, all that kind of stuff. We'd work with them for a month and we'd see whether or not this is someone that we wanted to invest in the next stage of employee development, which we saw as three months of working with Mick personally in his office, um, you know, us, us renting an apartment for them, condo for them, you know, feeding them, basically doing everything that we possibly need to do in Canada, which is where he's located. So, you'll, so, you'll take, so no matter where you hire anybody, you'll, you'll bring them, you'll follow them to where Mick is based and you'll put them up, you'll pay for their food, pay for their meals, pay for their accommodation, yes. pay for the flights out here. Basically yeah. everything's on, on your dime for three months as you're ramping them up. Yeah. I mean, we're talking an extra, just in terms of management and lease and food and logistics and all that kind of stuff and flights. We're talking about probably an extra $20,000 investment per rep. Wow. Uh, to be able to get them up and running properly. Now inside of that, they 
have no responsibility for, they're paid their base, but they have no real direct commission responsibility. Um, and then th our goal within those 90 days is to get them to the point in which they're hitting their commissions inside of our structure. If okay. they do not hit those commissions, they go home without a job. If they do hit their commissions, then they go home with a job. So we always return them to where they're from, um, but we wanna be able to know, can this work as a focused, you know, get, get that activity up and running, make sure that they're successful, get them successful in person, and we know that they've worked and they're successful in some respect. So we know that they can hit commission in person. Mm -hmm. So then we figure out, okay, well, can you do that when you go back to wherever you're from? <clears throat> um, and in the vast majority of cases, fortunately, it seems to be working, which is great. Uh, so we're, um, we're back up to more than half a dozen salespeople, SDRs, BDRs right now. Uh, and <clears throat> I think we have three AEs and the rest of them are just doing sales and business development inside of that funnel, but they're all, they have all either gotten that training in person or they are in the process of getting the training at this point. And that's been kind of the aha moment that we've discovered, which is having them interact directly has been what's been able to put them over the top. Now, also too, secondarily to that, for someone that can't afford that, uh, what we have been doing is we've been doing open Zoom calls. So we'll be able to have an open seat on any Zoom call and we actually encourage the sales development people and the, the sales people to be able to sit in on as many of those as humanly possible and then discuss it afterwards. So kind of almost like a virtual demo like mm -hmm. they're all in that same space. They're listening to that phone call happen because even in a sales, sales hall, sales uh, room office, you can hear those sales calls happening constantly. And you have that, oh, okay, that's how he, he's going through that demo or that's how he's addressing that question or she is addressing that question. So that's something that we're trying to replicate online um, so we're giving people the onboarding of that three months where they're getting the full experience. And then we're telling them they have to spend so much of their time continuing to listen to other sales development people to be able to get that feeling that uh, we found was lacking inside of the remote models that we had had before. Wow. That's great. So you've, you basically, you've got somebody come into your, you're flying them to your office, wherever that is for three, or you do a month working remotely to sort of prove, hey, was this person sort of mm -hmm. accurate with their resume? Then if, you, if they pass that test, the next hurdle is three months in person. And by the end of that, it's sort of trial by fire. If you're hitting your commission, if you're, if you're closing deals, then you go home with a job, sort of like a crazy game of survivor. Um, yeah. <laughs> they say yes to the close. <laughs> they have to, so within that first month, they have to either have, some type of unique activity that really excites us mm -hmm. or they have to close some type of a deal. Um, and that's generally pretty difficult within your first month mm -hmm. of uh, just understanding the product. But if they can do one of those two things or both of those things, then we say, yeah, this is somebody that we want to bring in for a couple months and, and get them up and running. And sometimes actually we've had people that have gone home early because we knew the activity just wasn't there. And we very clearly identify this beforehand. So it's, it's really important to just very clearly identify what your definition of success and failure is. Um, that's just general HR, but <laughs> it's even more important when you decide to take someone halfway across the planet mm -hmm. and put them in Canada uh, for a couple months. So we've had people go early, come back early because they're super successful and they don't need any more help. And then we've had people that have left early because we just know that it's not the right fit on both sides. So uh, that, I mean, and I think the failure rate right now is probably about 50% inside of that three month, um, three month time period. So in reality, actually, we're onboarding people for probably about 30 to $40,000 per, per rep, which is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does give us, which is a unique tactical advantage is we
And that's been huge for us. In so this is the best Wi-Fi sort of choke point. You said yeah. you've given a, it's given us a huge tactical advantage, and then it just and then it stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so the, it's given us a really fantastic tactical advantage, which is sales teams are now distributed everywhere. Mm-hmm. So we have sales reps in Southeast Asia that approach the. We have a. a expats in Southeast Asia that are fantastic salespeople that are able to hit the Southeast Asian market, which is a really profitable market for us. Um, and it's on their time zone. They understand the culture. They understand all of the situations connected to Southeast Asia. Then you have, you know, North American team, you have a South American team, you have a European team. So, and they're all located in those local markets. So they understand that market on top of being trained properly and they're not doing sales meetings at three o'clock in the morning, as an example, with um, Singapore, which is something that was happening before. Yeah, I've been, in our early days, I was foolish to try and sell directly to Australia. And I remember getting up for the last time at 3 a.m. to do a demo, because it's always that like, well, do I get up early or do I stay up? Yeah. And it's like, well. I'm a stay up guy myself. Uh, But if you do it on both ends, you will burn out very quickly. Yeah, I, I've always been an early riser, but I in the, at that period of time, I was I was both an early riser and I'd work, and sometimes I'd work till like I'd be at the office till midnight. And this is like the first kind of year where it's it was really tough, and I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm like, I'm just going to throw as much activity at it as I possibly can, and hopefully, just the sheer work w- and not intelligence will kind of get me through, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I think it did. Sometimes uh, that works. So, yeah. Sometimes it doesn't. I think that that's a that's an interesting thing to try, but then, uh, you know, sometimes you can just grind your gears for a few months and make it through. And then other times you end up going to a mental ward. Yeah. It really depends. Yeah. I think I, you know, we got lucky in terms of the timing of how things worked out. You know, maybe there was a little bit of intelligence, but I think it was mostly hard work, lucky timing, a little bit of intelligence. Um, but yeah, getting up for that 3 a.m. demo, I slept through a couple and then I got up for the last one and I was like, I'm on the call and I'm like, I'm in my like living room because my wife is, or my future wife is sleeping in the bedroom. And I'm like, right. this is just terrible. Like I got to get, I'm going to go back. Now I'm, I'm fully awake-ish. I've got to go back to bed in 20 minutes um, and then try and get a reasonable sleep between now and then. And then, and now in like 6am when I get up and then I got to get up and try and do meaningful work. Like I was just, you'd be a total write off the next day. Mm-hmm. So yes, mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, having people sell in that same time zone, um, very, very powerful. Right. Yeah, so. no, it's, it's one of those things that I've been, um, reticent about. I think that anyone on the, executive or founder side, you know, the first salesperson, when I was in Manila for those first critical months where I was testing out this assumption, and when you just don't have the resources, you say, well, I will be the resource. I'm, you know, I'm theoretically free or I'm significantly underpaid Mm -hmm. in comparison to what I would be making inside of a regular organization for doing the same work. But I was working from 8 a.m. till two o'clock in the morning for months. And I know that around the two month mark, I I had a total burnout where I had to cancel all my meetings for about a week and a half. And I just pretty much laid on, (laughs) laid on the couch in my apartment and just didn't do anything. So it's always, you have to be mindful of that is, um, and it can, I find it can sneak up on you very quickly that you just don't even recognize how tired you are. I remember about a week beforehand, a friend of mine said, you look like shit. And I was like, oh, really? Well, I'm really excited about all the sales development that we're doing, you know, because I, I was so excited about all this stuff that yeah. was happening, but yet I needed to pay attention to my body. And that's something that a lot of people just unfortunately don't pay attention to, particularly when they get excited. 100% agree. Um, I, I didn't, so I sold my car when I'd started the business. Um, and I walked, or I, I was like, "All right, I'll take I'll take transit because there's this co-working space downtown." And I'm a social person. I, I can work from home, but I prefer working around people. So whether it's an office or co-working space, that's just what I enjoy. 
and I didn't have the cash flow to afford a bus pass and I hated taking the bus. And so I had a bike and so I biked in and I didn't realize the impact that that was having on me every day of just having a little bit of exercise here and there uh, in the morning, in the evening was probably one of the best things that I'd done for mm. my, myself, my, my mental health, my physical health, just sanity overall. Um, that was huge for me. Mm, yeah, there's a, a friend of mine who coaches a lot for SaaS businesses called Dan Martell. Mm, mm. And he has this saying, sweat every day, which I think is probably a really great life lesson. Just sweat once a day doing something. And it's going to really change how happy you are. Um, I've found that with just going to the gym every day, even if it just means getting on a Stairmaster for 10 minutes, it really does. It gives you an opportunity for your unconscious mind to unload itself <clears throat> because when you're sweating, you can't think of that much stuff. Um, you can only just think about continuing to breathe until the next moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just such a nice mental release to get to just clear everything out of that mental memory and uh, so that you can start fresh. Like yeah, whenever I address really complex problems, <clears throat> I'll usually approach it for about an hour or two and then do some type of extreme physical activity. And it's what I call my shower moment because your brain, your, your frontal cortex shuts down and the older parts of your brain wake back up and your frontal cortex is processes that information without you consciously interacting with it. And then you just have these aha moments, which are, mm -hmm. um, I've found that that's a recurring way for me to figure out a really complex problem is load myself up with all that complex information. If I can't figure out the solution, perform extreme physical exercise for, an, for a short amount of time. And my brain will kind of process that information on its own and then come up with a solution. That's awesome. My... I'm going to give that a try next time. My, my tac tactic has always been sleep. Um, and just specifically because I, I started playing guitar when I was really young mm -hmm. and, uh, I was, I was always amazed at like, I'd be struggling to play something in the evening and I'd wake up the next morning and I could play it like significantly better. I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I guess sometimes you just, and so like, if I ever got stuck on something, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go play something else. And, you know, maybe I'll try it one, one or two more times, but if I'm just really not making any progress, instead of hammering and hammering and hammering, I'm just going to go have and have a sleep or like go to bed for the evening and I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll probably be able to play a little bit better. And, uh, I was really fortunate to kind of figure that out. Probably not as young as I think I did, but you know, you know, sometime in high school, just sort of realized that sometimes you just need to sleep on it. Well, that is, there's a bunch of data that says like, you know how people have their aha moments in the shower mm -hmm. is because they're just getting out of bed and they're in the shower and then they, they have it because their brain has processed all that information throughout the evening. Um, I've just found a way to short circuit that and make it faster is to do extreme physical activity for a very short amount of time. I'm talking 20 minutes. Gotcha. Um, and you then like, that, you like a climbing gym that. in your office kind of thing. You just like, I actually have a, chin, the walls. I have a chin up bar. Nice. <laughs> in the office. And then I'll go for a walk and maybe do a couple chin ups, like, you know, two sets of 10. Yeah. And you can't think of anything when you're doing the ninth chin up. At least for me. You might be on the 40th chin up. I don't know. You might be jacked. But like for me, you can't think of anything else other than doing the next chin up when you're yeah. on your ninth chin up. And then just magical stuff starts to happen. It's a interesting phenomenon and there's a lot of data to back it up so sleeping works but it's it's slower than what i wanted which was let's let's speed that process up and make sure that um we can get like a faster feedback loop i can usually do that twice a day and that ends up getting me a really good like working through those aha moments <clears throat> um pretty successfully that's awesome we, it's funny, we have a, in the office I'm in now, we used to have a gym. And if you look at the camera just over here, we actually still have an exercise bike that's oh, awesome. uh, it made its return. Uh, oh, you so can just jump on that. Like yeah. I would just think about a really complex idea and then just go, 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 go. And then, you know, you're 20 minutes later, you get off, sit back down on your seat and then just see what comes out. Mm -hmm. That's great, man. And 
sort of transitioning from like, I, I feel like I could just talk to you forever. Um, but I don't think, you know, everybody wants to listen to a four hour podcast. So maybe I should, um, sort of recap right. or take it back to, you know, talk to me about the, the culture, right. And I think one of the things you'd mentioned was you had a constant zoom hangout, right? Yes. To sort of keep the sales team connected. Absolutely. So is this just every, so talk to me about that. So that was just to be able to recreate the boiler room effect inside of um, a virtual sales team. That was really the, that's the, the point of that constantly on Zoom meeting, anyone being able to jump into the free seat on that Zoom meeting and listen in. We also have other things like we have um, a video game um, evening or morning. <clears throat> so everyone has to report just to play video games. The big one right now is Dota, which okay. is, um, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's a- It's, it's like League online, of Legends kind yeah, of- Yeah, it's an online video around, game I where I believe there's like six players on one side and six players on the other side, and we'll usually have them fight each other and they can switch up on teams. But what we do under for any game that we play is we make sure that team speak is on so that everyone can be chatting. Mm -hmm. and you'll have stuff that will come out that's not related to Dota at all. Um, just, hey, you know, I had this problem with this sales rep or th this, this lead, and this is how I solved it, <clears throat> those types of things, mm -hmm. on top of the regular formalized reporting meetings that we have. But those video game meetings are just an excuse to be able to collaborate. And um, who doesn't like getting paid to play video games? It's it's pretty tough life over at Time Doctor. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I mean that that for me is something that I think helps. Um, we have not cracked it by any stretch of the imagination. I think that if you chat with me in another two years, we're probably going to throw out fifty percent of what we currently do, or it will evolve into something else. But the interesting phenomenon right now is, as we had discussed before, remote work is still relatively new, particularly for people in tech. We've been the tip of the spear when it comes to remote work because we're so connected to this, which is the computer. Mm -hmm. And that's only starting right now for the rest of the world. So a lot of these best practices still haven't come out, um, in part why we run this conference running remote where we are trying to figure out best practices connected to remote teams and how they develop. But it's something that, you know, if there's anyone that <clears throat> I'm sure inside of the predictable re revenue community, there's probably plenty of different people that have different ways of doing it that are finding equal amounts of success, but it's just figuring out how to, get to that collaboration point. I think probably a clear signal for me is being able to get salespeople to collaborate efficiently means that they will make more money altogether as a team. So then it just, to me, means how can we get them to collaborate more, uh, either by forced method, like everyone has to play video games, whether you like video games or not, or you can choose whatever game you want to play, but you've got to do something, to something that is a lot more and those <clears throat> a lot more kind of organic which is those forced activities then hopefully produce dividends of everyone's chatting on slack organically about the issues that they're facing inside of the sales team which connects to culture obviously and us being able to make sure that everyone is working wherever they want to work um, but still productive because it comes back to, you know, the first and second class citizens. And if people that are remote feel like they're not part of that core culture, if they feel like they're lonely, if they feel like there there isn't that culture on Slack where, hey, people are just sort of chatting about, you know, whatever it is sometimes and not even just work related stuff. It's sort of that's those kind of those little interactions seem to be like the fiber that kind of hold together a work remote team. Absolutely. And I think you need to really clearly identify your culture in a remote work um, business. So it needs to be more direct <clears throat> than in an on-premise brick and mortar business because you don't pick up all of the nonverbal 
subtle components of culture <clears throat> that you would when everyone is is working remotely like Liam really likes uh, this component of remote work or here are the things that Liam would not do inside of this business or he would do inside of this business you need to communicate all of those things so I have as an example a document <clears throat> that I have which I give to every new employee that onboards as my direct report which is Liam and his nine little weird quirks <laughs> so I have this document and it's Liam and his nine little weird quirks and I'm very honest in that document discussing everything that I um, that, that makes up me and some of that stuff is pretty negative some of that stuff you wouldn't necessarily even admit to yourself but because I'm not physically next to that person if I was physically next to that person, they'd probably pick up that I'm a bit of a dick with regards to making sure that people don't give me options. I want as few options as humanly possible. The less options, the better. Other people might want a ton of options. Uh, I do not. I want to be able to, if you need to come to me with a decision, ideally, you should have done all of the work to reduce it down to two possible decisions, maximum three. If you come to me with eight different avenues for a decision, um, we won't be getting along very well. So that's me. And I just communicate that very clearly. So I have the document, and then I have about a 20-minute video that I've done on, um, on screen share where I basically go through this document and I discuss it with people or I discuss it with myself saying, here are the components of who I am as a person. Here's what my personality is. Here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. Here's how to work with me. It's kind of like the, the, work, the work manual for Liam Martin. How can you get along with Liam Martin and make sure that you're going to be in sync? And I encourage employees to actually make their own document, make a video about it, and send it back to me. And the funny thing is, we've, I've sent this document to people, and they've watched it and then recognized maybe we shouldn't be working together because I think we are actually have a pretty, like this is probably not the type of person that I would necessarily want to work with. Mm -hmm. So you would have picked that up inside of an on-premise brick and mortar business, but <clears throat> because we're virtual, it takes longer for that feedback loop to happen outside of doing team retreats, which we do every single year where we bring everybody into one place. That's usually another time for us to kind of get that type of interaction, but a way to short circuit that and do it a lot cheaper is to just make these, this kind of Liam and his weird little quirks. And if you're going to do it, it's really important to make sure that you put the negative components of who you are down just as much as the positive ones, because those are the ones that people need to know the most. And you might feel a little uncomfortable about um, discussing as mm. an example. That's great, man. It's, it's, um, it's impressive the level of sort of transparency and openness that you, you've displayed in getting the, I mean, on the show here and sharing the, all the things that sort of went right and most importantly went wrong, um, but also with the, with the team just in the, in the name of like helping them sort of ramp up and be great at their, in their roles. Yeah, I mean, if uh, they don't work out, we don't make money. <clears throat> so that's what we're all working towards is making sure that everyone can make money. And for everyone on the podcast, I mean, I'm, I'm always, I feel the more just general sharing that occurs on platforms like this, the more successful everyone is going to be. Um, I know that <clears throat> I'm addicted to, uh, to podcasts and um, I just find that people that don't really disclose what they're doing, it's it's not as helpful. Um, people need context to be able to work from. So I try to provide as much context as humanly possible. That's great, man. I really appreciate it. And I do want to, I want to get to the cold call role play like we talked about. Um, sure. But I just want to recap a couple of things that you've learned. Yep. So we, you talked about sort of um, needing to know how to differentiate, you know, real between real and bullshit activity. Mm -hmm. um, you had Nick holding people accountable to their forecast. And so mm -hmm. not not just, you know, talk to me about the, about the activity, but what have you closed? And then we, we talked in, the, in our previous conversation, and this was sort of on yours, uh, about being a marketer running a sales team. You want to talk a little bit about that one? 
Sure. I mean, that's been something that, again, connects to ego, which is as a marketer, um, I kind of always thought salespeople weren't as smart as me. If I'm going to come to you, and I now recognize that that is not the case at all, um, mm. they have different skill sets, equally valuable skill sets. It's like an apple and orange type of situation. And you'll even, I mean, I'm sure if you had a developer up here, he'd probably have the same argument with regards to salespeople. Uh, just because they're going out and having dinners with people doesn't mean they're not working as hard as you are. They're just doing different things. And I didn't recognize that. And I realized that I approach, I approach problems differently than a salesperson approaches them. And because of that, it resulted in so many failures <clears throat> inside of the sales team. And you either need to understand the mindset of a sales team to be able to lead it or salespeople, or you need to be able to hire out that type of talent. Um, so my suggestion would be like, read predictable revenue whole, a whole bunch of times, surround yourself with people that are, that have experience in sales and know what they're doing as a first option or option two, fire yourself, which is what I did. Right on, man. Um, I do want to end giving you a chance to promote, you know, one thing that, uh, that you're working on in the most sales podcast way possible. So you ready for the, <laughs> the cold call role play? Okay. I know you've been looking forward to this your whole life. Oh yeah. So what set, set the scene for me. Uh, who am I? Uh, what's my, like, what's, what's your ideal customer profile? What's my persona? Well, I mean, I, I, we could discuss time doctor to be honest with you, but I think the one that I'm more passionate about is uh, running remote, which is yeah. the conference that we run down in Bali. So that customer avatar, um, I can boil it down very clearly. It's a remote first founder. They have, uh, their team size is on average 106 people. Uh, they love to travel, but they primarily work in one place and they're building some type of a tech product. And they are really trying to figure out how to get from where they are right now to getting to 200 people, 300 people, 500 people, 1,000 people, um, and building and scaling out those remote companies. So that's kind of the mission statement of <clears throat> running remote, which is we want to collaborate and figure out what the playbook is for remote teams. So what are the best practices, identifying those best practices, figuring out who can replicate those best practices reliably in different situations, and then saying, yes, that's the way to move forward um, to be able to build out a sales team as an example. Perfect. So are you ready for this goal call? And I, I recognize that you, you're, I'm ready. You, you might I'm not a salesperson in a while. <clears throat> I think it's probably been like a year and a half. Cool. All right. <clears throat> ring, ring. Hey, this is Colin. Hey, this is Liam from running remote. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Liam? I'm pretty good. I was wondering whether or not you're interested in going to Bali. No. <laughs> Why not? It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, no. So, so seriously, I'm calling from running remote. Um, I know that you've interacted with some of our content before and you're interested in checking out running remote. We've got a couple tickets left for the conference. And I know that inside of predictable revenue, you guys run a remote team. And for us, it's something that we've found very passionate uh, we've had a lot of passion in this particular issue. It's something that is near and dear to our heart. And we thought to ourselves, it would be a shame if predictable revenue was not included at the conference. So what is it going to take for me to be able to get you to come down to Bali and learn the best practices on building and scaling remote teams? I'm just not, I'm not sure what the value is here. I can tell you the value. So we have people that are absolutely at the tip of the spear with regards to building and scaling remote teams. We have people like Marcy Murray, who is the director of support for Shopify. She's managing 2000 remote support reps, and she's actually going to go through everything that you can possibly learn about building and scaling a remote sales team. We have Andreas Klinger, who is the CTO of Product Hunt and now is the director of HR for AngelList. And he's going to show us 
how to be able to take a, a, a development team of 15 reps and, or 15 developers and build and scale something as big as Product Hunt or Angel List. And we have a ton of other people that kind of connect to that particular issue. Um, everything that you could possibly think about building and scaling a remote team inside of your business. And I know based off of the research that I've done, it's something that you are definitely looking to be to expand upon. Uh, I know about your team in Cancun. Very interesting, by the way, to be able to build and scale out that team out of Cancun. And I think if you're interested in continuing on building that company out, um, remote is definitely the way to go. And I think you've kind of recognized that by um, building out a remote team yourself. All right. You, you got me. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was actually really bad. Um, I've probably not done a cold call in, I just realized literally my sales manager was whispering in the back of my ear being like, stop talking, Liam. Start asking questions and stop <laughs> talking. Um, but that's me, right? That's how I do sales. And that's why I wouldn't hire myself. That's fair. Yeah. Liam, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This was awesome. There was so much content packed in here. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing everything. Thanks for having me.